Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 176. Investigate a shooting at 741 Orange Street, Monrovia. That's all. Recently, we interviewed motorists who listened to Calling All Cars to learn why they were first attracted to Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Some typical answers. I am a salesman. I drive 25,000 miles a year. I started using Rio Grande cracked gasoline because it is the first choice among police officers. They drive harder, faster, and farther in a year than I do. They ought to know their gasoline, and they do. Oh, I get police car performance all right from Rio Grande cracked. We all listen to calling all cars at our house. One night when you explained about the Sinclair cracking process, you said... Coffee beans have to be cracked or ground to release their full flavor. And so we crack gasoline to release its full power. Now, that sounds reasonable. And <laughs> although they say women don't reason, that's what made me a Rio Grande customer. That long list of cities and counties using Rio Grande cracked gasoline is what got me started. I don't remember any other oil company pointing to a record like that. I've never had a reason to change from Rio Grande cracked. I find it better than any other gasoline I've ever used. The Rio Grande list of city and county users is indeed a convincing one. Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Marysville, Fresno, Santa Barbara, Pasadena, Monterey Park, Linwood, San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Santa Barbara County, San Diego County, Orange County, Maricopa County, Coconina County, and many, many other cities and counties. The list is twice as long as it was last year. And now we add the name of Glendora, delightful city of the citrus belt tucked in between the foothills and the San Gabriel Valley. Rio Grande is proud to serve Glendora with police car performance. Join these intelligent buyers of gasoline, those to whom gasoline means most. From now on, in your own car, get police car performance. Once again, we present Sheriff Eugene Diskeloos of Los Angeles County. Sheriff Diskeloos. Thank you. Good evening. Over a period of the last three and a half years, we have had many stories broadcast over calling all cars. And in most of these, we have attempted to show in a small way how the sheriff's office functions when it goes about bringing a criminal to justice. Tonight, however, our story is a little different. We are going to probe a little deeper than we usually do. Attempt to show how crimes are born. This evening's story can't hope to illustrate the hundreds of different reasons for crime, but it does show clearly one phase of it. If people could only realize that just as there are doctors for the ills of the skin, the bones, there are also doctors for the mind. That worry allowed to torture a mind too long becomes a disease that should be treated as any common ailment from a cold on. There would be a great deal less crime of the type found tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we welcome as guest artist on Calling All Cars, Mr. Russell Gleason, who has just completed the motion picture Big Business for 20th Century Fox. In tonight's drama, he will play the part of Charlie Johnson. Monrovia, two minutes past nine on the morning of April 15th, 1934. The scene, a man and a woman standing, facing each other, staring into one another's eyes, saying nothing, only breathing, breathing heavily. Thank you. Something 
and I can turn to Edward. I heard the door. Oh. Give me the police station, please. Police? Hello? Would you send an ambulance and some officers to 741 Orange Street, please? <gasps> There's been a shooting here. Would it be all right if I stayed here for a moment? Uh, yes. Of course. And I, I wouldn't go in there just yet. It isn't a very pretty sight. She's lying there on the floor. <laughs> and there's blood. <laughs> and there's blood. <laughs> Time later, confronted by Officer Phillips of the Monrovia Police Department, a dazed young man leads the way back up a flight of stairs, points at the figure of a young woman lying in a pool of blood on the floor. There she is. Well, who did it? Who did it? Oh, I thought you'd you. I did. You did? Why? What difference does that make? I did it. Isn't that enough? Uh, who reported this? I did. You. You shot her, and then you, you phoned for the police? Yes. And you, you haven't got any reason why you did it? Well, I had reason enough, I guess, only it takes too long to tell. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? Let's go. And at the police station, the strange young man proves willing enough to talk about anything but why he did it. A report from the hospital brings the news that his victim, suffering from three bullet wounds in the head, abdomen, and groin, is dying. But there is no chance of her living more than a few hours. With this report, Officer Phillips decides to make an emergency report to the sheriff's office in Los Angeles. And accordingly, Deputy Sheriff Ken Praise hurries to Monrovia, checks with officials. You know, the thing that gets me in this is this fellow's attitude. He seems to be all gone inside. Beaten by something. Yeah, have you any physical evidence, a gun or anything else? Yeah, I found the gun lying in the girl. And I've got all the empty cartridge cases and one leaden slug. And the other two are still in the girl. Now, come in. Here's that fellow who knew the victim, Lieutenant. We picked him up at his home. Oh, good. Come on in. In here. Thanks. Uh, you're uh, Steve Wilson, that right? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Deputy Penpray from Los Angeles. He's come up to investigate this. Glad to know you. Oh, yeah. Young Johnson told us you knew him. You also knew the girl who was shot tonight. Uh, that right, Mr. Wilson? Yes, I, I knew my... Uh, you knew she was shot a little while ago, huh? Well, that's what the officer who brought me here told me. I it's sort of hard to believe. I, I saw her last night. Where? At her apartment. Charlie came in, and I figured they wanted to talk, so I left. I wish to God I'd known what he was going to do. I'd have kept him from doing it or something. Well, soon this Johnson kid seems to have something on his mind that he won't tell us. You any idea what it might be? Well, well, yes and no. I, I know if I'd done what he did, I'd have plenty on my mind too. But well, aside from the fact that he's pretty much of a louse, I don't know. So you were pretty interested in this Myers girl, weren't you? That's right. I was. How about Johnson? Listen, if I have to tell you all about it, I will. But I wish you'd, you'd get it out of him if you can. I'm liable to say things that, well, might make it tough on him. Naturally, the way I feel right now, I. I can't feel anything but hate for him. All right, Wilson, I understand. I'm going to have a little talk with Johnson, and maybe he'll feel more like talking now. However, if he doesn't, will you be willing to tell us what you know? Sure. All right, then suppose you go back wherever you were and take it easy. We got in touch with you. Okay. And thanks. I guess I'm a little upset by all this. But... All right, you go home and get some rest. Okay. Thanks. Well, you're sort of all broken up about it, eh, Philip? Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad. Well, people are like that. Suppose we go in and see how this Johnson lad feels now. I'll have to take him back to the city tonight and book him in the county jail. Yeah, all right. He's sitting in the captain's office looking at the floor last time I saw him. All right, let's go in and see him. Well, Johnson, this is the deputy sheriff from Los Angeles. He wants to talk to you. Sure. Everybody wants to talk to me. Everybody wants to ask a million questions. For what reason? You have my statement that I shot her. Isn't that enough? No, not quite, Johnson. We'd like to know why you did it. Now, what made you deliberately shoot a girl that you claimed to have been crazy about? Are you insane? Insane? Sure. If you recall what I've been going through, insanity. Only, I didn't mean to shoot her. I was going to kill myself, and then I suddenly saw her there, and I... Oh, what difference does that make? What good... Now, what, what I say, I'm... Hey. Oh, look, come on. Take it 
take a hold of yourself and try to understand something. Sooner or later, you're going to be trying for murder. Murder? Yeah, the girl you shot is dying. She hasn't a chance in the world to live, according to the doctor. Then why don't you take me out of here and finish it off? Strap me in the chair. Drop me through a trap of the rope around my neck. Anything. Why keep playing with me? Well, because we want to know why you did it, Charlie. You want to know why I did it? You want to know? Do you suppose I don't? All right, then let's hear all about it. Maybe you can get it straight in your own mind. All right. Only it's going to take a lot of time. A lot of talking to tell you about it. All right, we're willing to listen, Charlie. Now go ahead. Okay. You see, the trouble was that I was nuts about it. You know how it is. You meet someone and you fall for them. And you begin figuring maybe you're really in love. That's what happened to me. I met her through a friend of mine one night at a party. There was a lot of people there fooling around and tossing down a few drinks, and this friend of mine introduced us. We were standing in the kitchen, building a drink. <laughs> hey, where do you two think you're going? I didn't say you could have her. Just wanted to introduce you to each other. <laughs> Be back in a minute, Freddie. You work on that drink you've got in your hand, you'll feel better. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> How long have you been marooned with that laughing hyena? I lost count after the first 50 years. Look, I got a swell idea. How's about you and me sneaking out and driving somewhere? We could run the back door here and nobody'd be the wiser. You think Freddie'd be sore? I don't think Freddie's going to know whether he's standing or sitting after about one more of those drinks he's down. Come on, let's be different. Well, why not? After all, wasn't it somebody named Columbus who took a chance? That's the spirit. Here, out this way. And if you're a nice little girl, I'll order a moon just for you to play with. Oh. <laughs> and as Penn plays and Phillips listen, Deputy Lynch, stenographer, makes a silent record of Charles Johnson's budding romance of Mars. For several weeks, the infatuation grows, and then shortly before Christmas, Charles picks her up one night, drives to a secluded spot where he parks his car. Turns off the light. Well, why this? I thought we were going to a party somewhere. Listen, Mark, you and I have been running around together for weeks now. So far, we've had a swell time. Kidding and all that. But I can't kid anymore. I'm nuts about you. Charlie. Now, wait a minute. I know you think a lot of screwy ideas about marriage and love and all that, but you're all wrong. I'm crazy about you, Mark. I want you to marry me. But... Well, how are we going to get married when you haven't even got a job? I've got one. It's a thing for me if you'll say you'll marry me. How about it? Well, I... Look, I got a ring here. I want you to have it. Well, Charlie, you don't give me any time to think. You like me, don't you? Yes, I like you. And I'm nuts about you. Come on, tell me. Well... Yes. Please. Well, all right, Charlie. I'll wear your ring. And I'll have a job inside of 24 hours. You wait. I'll show you that I can get places. With you, I can hit the top. <laughs> Saying it proves easier than actually doing it. And weeks go by in which Charlie makes no progress. Weeks also in which Charlie's attitude towards Marge changes. Becomes bitter, mean. And Marge, what of her? Honestly, Steve, I don't know what to do about Charlie. He's so jealous he won't let me do anything. Why don't you think him, Marge? Tell him to lay off. Oh, I... I don't know, Steve. Maybe it's because I feel a little sorry for him. He's so sort of young about everything. Still, he's not young. Oh, I don't know what to do. Is he coming over tonight? Oh, yes, he wouldn't miss. Hey, why don't you tell him how you feel? You can't just go on fighting all the time. I know that's what I ought to do, only I... Only you feel sorry for him, and you can't better hurt him. Isn't that it? I, I guess so. Well, then don't be silly. Talk to him tonight and finish it. Get it settled once and for all. Well, I, I don't know whether I can get the nerve to do it or not, but I'll try. I know that's what I want. And that's what I want, too. You know that? I'll try, Steve. I'll try my very hardest. Just a minute. Hello, baby. Oh, oh, it's you, Charlie. Come in. Wait a minute. What did you mean by that crack? It's you, Charlie. Who did you think it might be? Oh, please. Come inside, Charlie. I don't want people to hear us out here. What did you mean by that crack? Nothing, really. Okay. I'll come in. I'll be back in in a minute, as soon as I finish my makeup. Yeah, sure. Only haven't you forgotten something? Forgotten something? Yeah. Or don't you kiss me anymore? Oh, well, sure. I guess I did forget, Charlie. 
I will as soon as I come back. Say, what's all this about? All what? All this funny talk. You've got something on your mind. No, I haven't. Honestly. Come on, baby. You can't kid me. What's up? Nothing. I said what's up. And I said nothing. Oh, I'm going to get tough about it, huh? Okay. Only I don't like it. Charlie, I'm going to tell you something. I have got something on my mind. A whole lot of things. I've been afraid to say them before, but now I'm going to. Go away. Ed, I'm listening. I've said a lot from you lately, Charlie. A, a lot more than I had any reason to. And uh, I'm not going to take it anymore. What do you mean by that? Oh, just what I said. I, I'm through. I am breaking everything off. Hey, wait a minute. Who have you been talking to? No one. Well, yes, you have. I can tell. Who's been filling you with a lot of talk, turning it against me? No one. No? No. Look at me, baby. All right. You're lying in your teeth, and you know it. I'm not lying, and I'm not going to listen to any more from you. Now get out of here and stay out. You don't really mean that. Oh, yes, I do. Get out. Why, you little tramp. Okay, I'll get out. But before I do, let me give you a little warning. I told you once I was in love with you. I'm telling you the same thing now. And I'm going even further than that. I'll get out, and I'll stay until you want me back. But if I catch you playing around with anyone else, it'll be tough for you and for him, too. Understand? Perfectly. Now, will you get out? Kiss me first. Charlie! I said kiss me. Don't touch me. Don't. There. Now I'll go. Yes. Let him find it out, Wade. Yeah, sure. This is too good to stop. All right, wait a minute. 
wait a minute now. Now, look, mister. You and your girlfriend better go somewhere else. See, this is a respectable place here. We don't like this sort of thing, see? See, are you trying to throw us out? I'm asking you to leave. Well, I'm not leaving until I get good and ready to. What do you think of that? Please, Charlie. As for you, I don't care whether you go home or not. Hello. Yes. Hey, Steve. Show this gentleman the door, will you? All right, buddy. How would you like it? Walking or flying? Listen, if you think you can throw me out of here... Come on, Steve. Come on. Hey, let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. Humiliated, disgusted, Marge back his home, leaving Charlie fighting with a few stalwart bouncers, Al and Steve. But the struggle is short-winded, and he's deposited roughly in the gravel outside the place. And as the realization of the scene creeps into his mind, his fury suddenly gives way to a new feeling. Marge. What will she think now? At the corner drugstore, he phones her. Receives no answer. In his car, he drives to her apartment, pounds on the door. But she fails to reply. And inside Charlie's jealously crazed mind, something snaps. Reason, sanity, every stable emotion is suddenly swept away in a blaze of passion. All the rest of that night, he walks and sleeps, thinking. The next day, he phones, but she hangs up on him and then begins an incredible week of fast-moving events. Monday, Marge receives a letter. My dearest Marge, for your sake, read this. I've got to know you've forgiven me. I put you before everything, friends, family, self. I tried to prove to you that I'm a man, and I know I'm a coward, a fool, a little boy. Believe me, Marge, I love you more than life. Tuesday at Marge's house. Marge, please, open the door and let me talk to you. Go away, darling. Stop writing those letters. But listen, Marge, I've got to talk to you. I, I'll kill myself if I can't see you. You haven't the nerve. All right, but you'll feel differently when you read about it. I can't stand it any longer. I can't. Wednesday, an envelope containing three playing cards. Written on the eight of hearts. Here is my heart. It is yours. Do with it as you will. Crush it, break it, tear it apart, or curse it. It beats for you alone. On the two of hearts. This is our hearts as we were once. Two minds with but a single thought. Two hearts that beat as one. And on the tray of hearts? This signifies the things that might have been. A little piggy of our own. Thursday. At a friend's house in Pasadena. Well, you're more than welcome to the gun, Charlie, but what do you want it for? I've got a job chauffeuring, and I have to go to the beach for the weekend. I thought I might need some protection. Will I get you into trouble as you get caught carrying it? Oh, no, I got a permit to carry a gun. It'll be all right. Well, it's all right by me, Charlie. You can take that automatic there, only... Don't get in any trouble with it. Oh, don't worry. I won't. Even if I do, it won't reflect on you. Friday. Charlie walks the streets for hours, his muddled brain trying to grasp at some straw of reason. Love, hate, self-pity all rise in his mind, distorting every sane thought. Late that evening, another phone call. And this time he hears Marge's voice. Hello? Marge. Listen, please don't hang up. You've got to hear me out. Charlie, I told you we were through. Can't you get that into your head? But I've got to see you just for a few minutes. I've got to say goodbye. I don't want to see you, Charlie. I tried to tell you nicely, but you won't listen. So this is the only way left. Marge, listen to me. If someone you didn't know asked you to do a favor for them, a favor that meant everything in life, you'd do it, wouldn't you? Why, is it nice? Well, I'm asking you that favor. All I want to do is to see you. Talk to you for a few minutes. And then I'll leave for good. I won't bother you again. You told me that before. This time I mean it. You've got to do it, Marge. I'm sorry, Charlie. I, I can't see you. Now I'm going to say goodbye. But wait a minute. Marge. Marge, I'm coming over to see you. I've got to talk to you once more. Saturday, April 15th, 1934. 7.30 a.m. Who is it? Who is it? Oh, wait a minute. Charlie. I told you I was coming over, Marge. And I told you not to. Now, look. You've got to stop all this. I can't stand it any longer. You can't stand it. That's a laugh. I suppose you think I'm living in a bed of roses. Well, I'm not. I'm sorry, Charlie, but I'm not interested in anything you have to say. Now, will you go away and let me alone? Can't I come in for a minute? No. 
I won't cause a scene. Honestly, I just want to say goodbye. Oh, Charlie, why can't you understand? I do understand perfectly. The least you can do is talk to me for a few minutes. All right. Come in, then. You can't stay long. Don't worry, I won't. I'll stand up if you don't mind. I I can talk better that way. All right, Charlie. Marge, you remember that night I met you at Freddy's? The night he was so drunk and we went out the back door? Yes. Remember how swell that was? And how much fun we had after at the beach? Everywhere we went? Yes, I remember. And then something happened. What was it? Oh, please, Charlie. Listen, I've got to know why we busted up. I'm going crazy because I don't know. Charlie, listen to me. I'm sorry you've been hurt. Terribly sorry. But there's nothing I can do about it now. It's all over. Finished. Don't you understand? Yes. I understand. Then will you go now and just forget all about me? Yes. I'll go now. And don't do anything silly, Charlie. I, I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Then you... No. I only feel sorry for you. Terribly sorry. I don't want to leave yet, Mark. I've got so many things to say. But you've got to. Let me back in for a little more time, please. Oh, Charlie, don't spoil everything. But I've got to. It's important. Oh, Charlie, for the love of heaven, will you please get out of here and let me get some sweet Steve's coming for me at night, and I've got to look decent. Steve's coming for you. You've got to look decent for Steve. Charlie. All right. You'll look decent. The only way you ever could be decent. Charlie, put that gun away, please. Decent for Steve. <laughs> On June 18, 1934, Charles Johnson was sentenced by Judge Elliot Craig to the term prescribed by law for the charges of murder in the first degree. The sentence carried with it, however, recommendations for leniency due to the nature of the crime and the willingness of the accused to admit his guilt. Thus, for his hasty act, and because he did not think first, Charles Johnson is now in San Quentin Penitentiary, a victim of his own unbridled passion. you heard typical expressions of everyday users of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. You know already that more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment use Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. You know that Rio Grande cracked was used last year for more than 50 million miles of law enforcement driving. Don't deprive yourself of police car performance any longer. See your nearest independent Rio Grande dealer. While you are there, ask him to help you select the correct grade of Sinclair motor oil for your car. Eight out of ten drivers use the wrong grade of oil. He can tell you whether you should use SAE 10, 20, 30, and so forth. You'll save money and get better performance when you know. Ask him also for a free copy of Calling All Cars News. The current issue is full of interesting features. An exclusive interview with James Cagney. A salute to RKO's new star, Joanne Fontaine. Detective stories. A men wanted page. Everything. See your Rio Grande dealer tomorrow. Broadcast 176 regarding the shooting. The suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Those and those. Your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bid you good night for Rio Grande.